in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Welcome back to the Eat Fluencer podcast. I'm Maggie Landis. I'm your host today, and we are talking about saturated fat. You know, some of my episodes are a little more about psychology and mindset. Some of them are a little more about the social commentary and diet culture and all that predatory marketing stuff we have to talk about. But today we're nerding out about nutrition science because every once in a while, I feel like we have to do that. Before we get into today's episode, I want to remind you that if you are not yet in my free private Facebook group for women, I would love to have you there We talk about all these things all the time. And if you send me a message on Instagram or Facebook, simply saying Facebook, I'll get you your invitation so you can join the group right away. But right now we are listening, you are listening to episode 53 of the Eat Fluencer podcast. This is called the Saturated Fat Snafu. Here's the deal. I get asked this question probably more than any other specific kind of nutrient type question. What about fat and specifically what about saturated fat? Um, The short answer is that there's still quite a bit of questions. There's still quite a bit of controversy in the nutrition and health communities. The answer to how much fat is okay, how much fat is good, what are the limits, should it be unsaturated, should it be saturated, those questions are more complicated than you may think they are. Um, So it's hard for me to make this simplistic, and I'm going to try as best I can, but even just having you be aware that there is controversy, that this is not clear cut for anybody, may be the Um, impetus you need to kind of let go of it a little bit. So if you're my age, you grew up in the 80s and 90s and the whole diet narrative at the time was that fat, all fat is bad. I mean, this was the complete heyday of fat free everything. You were, you know it. This was where, you know, all these breakfast cereals and all these food products could get like a check mark for being uh, heart healthy because they had no fat. And even though they were just made out of sugar and stuff, it's um, the idea came from a very kind of antiquated hypothesis that eating fat makes you fat, makes your cholesterol go up, that ends up in your coronary arteries and you have heart attack and you die. And that that happens in a very clear, linear fashion. So the idea, as we in the 80s and 90s were watching, you know, heart disease really emerge as one of the leading causes of death, particularly in men, was that we got to stop that chain of events. And the beginning of that chain was cutting out fat. So that was where that that came from. Now, fast forward 20, 30 years later, uh, the incidence of heart disease is still going up and people are now um, blaming carbohydrates and saying, no, 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 maybe that's not right. Maybe fat is good for us and it's the carbohydrates that are making us have heart attacks and die. So the fact that this pendulum swings back and forth between the macronutrients every you know, let's say 20 or 30 years is the evidence that this is a complicated conversation. And I will say, if you are kind of coming to rest in a more moderate, um, less extreme place, you're probably eating carbohydrates and fats in your diet now, which is really what I would advise that you do. Um, Fat has a lot of purposes. Fat 
covers our nervous system. Fat makes your brain work. Um, hormones and most of the components of the endocrine system are made of fats. Fat gives you energy. Fat is um, a very energy dense nutrient source. Uh, it's also a major reason that food is palatable and satisfying. And there's a lot of reasons to eat fat. So, you know, now that we're eating fat compared to 40 years ago when we were avoiding fat, there's this nuanced conversation about, well, what type of fat? Maybe, maybe there's a big difference between unsaturated fat and saturated fat and, um, kind of judgment and fear mongering about what we're doing to our bodies if we um, eat one type versus the other. And that's what we're talking about today. So the idea that saturated fat is bad for you is a very old idea. That is not news. That is not new. The uh, original dietary guidelines that the U.S. government um, put out in the late 70s essentially said that saturated fat should be limited, um, should be limited to about 10% or less of the daily calorie intake. And more or less over the course of the last, you know, 40 to 50 years, that has basically continued to be the recommendation. Um, in fact, the World Health Organization even uses a number like this. And, and there's other countries that use even a more restrictive number, and they say 7% or 8%. Um, but 7 to 10% of your daily intake being the maximum amount of saturated fat one is, quote, recommended to eat, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. That is in the neighborhood of probably... 20 to 22 grams of saturated fat. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't like calories and I don't like calorie counting. And I honestly think those recommended daily things are, are pretty bogus that it would be uniform across all people and uniform across all time. Uh, but just using that as sort of the meter stick here, you know, 20 to 22 grams of saturated fat you're going to get to that really quick in a um, even sort of typical American diet. One tablespoon of butter, one ounce of cheese, or one hundred gram serving of animal protein, that's about seven grams of fat, each of those, not together, each of those. So, you know, you can get to 20 pretty quick. Three ounces of cheese would be about 20 grams. Uh, 10 ounces of animal protein would be about 20 grams, you know, a couple of tablespoons of butter and a small portion of animal protein. That would be 20. There's, there's a lot of ways to get to 20. So it, the point being, this may not be a realistic place to obsess or restrict because it's just not what the typical person is going to be able to do over a long period of time. And, you know, furthermore, do we need to? You know, I think restricting anything rigidly is a major detriment to our health. And the psychological stress response, which leads to the physical stress response of cortisol, adrenaline, and blood pressure, and blood sugar, and all these things, um are the things we're trying to reduce by restricting, but perhaps are coming completely undone by the psychological uh, fortitude required to restrict them. You know, in short, we're becoming so neurotic, we're undoing any potential benefit. But what's the answer? I mean, if it really preserves our longevity, if it really prevents disease, maybe we will be more um, committed to, to restricting, to adhering to it. But I'm going to tell you here in short that that's not the case. There are so many people saying so many different things about fat in the diet out there. And no wonder you're confused. I'm confused. And the way it usually happens is these people some are scientists, some are not scientists, um, will sort of cherry pick the results that they like out of 
the literature, whether or not it's quality literature is kind of beside the point. They just pick what supports their um, hypothesis. That's classic confirmation bias. And then they take this nugget of quasi-truth and twist it and sort of morph it into a narrative that supports their product or their line of service or their own anecdotal experience or their lifestyle. And the fact that all these different, quote, experts uh, believe that they have evidence to support their um, hypothesis is the evidence that the answer is really way more complex than any of them are leading you to believe. I mean, are we supposed to be cooking with olive oil? Are we supposed to be using coconut oil, vegetable oil, butter, animal lard? Are we supposed to be eating plant-based vegan? Are we supposed to be eating all carnivore with no plants? Are we supposed to, uh, you know, pick low fat dairy? Are we supposed to eat full fat dairy? Are we supposed to eat no dairy? I mean, you can see this is really uh, distressing to most of us because most of us are not nutrition scientists. Most of us are not interested in um, analyzing data and looking at, you know, <laughs> the the c huge compendium of nutritional literature that's been produced in 50 years. We just want to go to the grocery store, buy something that we're relatively sure is not going to kill us or our family, um, and go home and cook it and eat it and get on with it. But it's really, really confusing. And I would say that this whole conversation about saturated fat is one of the most uh, confusing and, I guess, controversial pieces that's out there. Here's what is true. Saturated fat is a molecular description, all right? Get, without getting too chemistry-ish with you, if you think of fats as, like, if it looks like the capital letter E, all right? There's a glycerol backbone and then three long fatty acid uh, we'll call them tails. That's how fats are structured. Um, a saturated fat is referring to the fact that all the bonds, all the chemical bonds along the tails are single bonds. That means they're saturated, saturated with hydrogen. Unsaturated just means that somewhere along those tails, there is a double bond that can happen in one place. That makes it a mono one unsaturated fat. It can happen in many places that makes it a poly unsaturated fat. Um, those can happen at different points along the tail. And that, um, you know, changes the three-dimensional shape of the fat. There are different places where hydrogen can interact and, and the unsaturated fats are a little more um, reactive, if I can use that word, because they have the ability to take on one or more new hydrogen particles. Okay, bottom line, that is a chemistry word, not a clinical word. And so I want to make sure you understand that. And the truth is food, which is what you really care about, most foods are a combination of saturated and unsaturated fats. Some are mostly saturated, some are mostly unsaturated, some have a pretty good balance of the two, but there's lots of types of each. This is not just a binary saturated versus unsaturated conversation because there's different lengths of those tail chains. There's different places where the double bonds are. There's different, um, you know, pos positions in terms of the three-dimensional structure and all these things. So we're we're truly dealing with a zillion different compounds, not just two things. So anybody who simplifies it to saturated fats are this and unsaturated fats are that doesn't understand that there's more to it. Generally speaking, this is a general rule that saturated fats are more likely to be solid at room temperature. Um, so you know, with the exception of that being milk, milk has got um, quite a bit of saturated fat, um, ice cream, chocolate, cheese, butter, um, those sorts of things. Dairy, dairy by and large is uh, mostly saturated fat. Unsaturated fats would be things like olive oil, vegetable oil, 
um, soybean oil, which is the one of the biggest commercial um, type of oils used in dressings and sauces, that sort of thing. Um, nuts, seeds. Now, margarine is mostly unsaturated. You know, margarine was born out of the, you know, <laughs> mid 20th century narrative that butter is going to kill us. And so they, you know, conveniently made all these artificial butter substitute things, which are still on the market, interestingly, even though they've been shown to be really pretty terrible for our health. That's just a side note. And then um, animal proteins, uh, a lot of commercial baked goods and um, shelf-stable food products, stuff like that, have a combination of saturated and unsaturated fat, fat in them. Well, let's... Let's talk about what is the problem with looking at the science. Like, why can't somebody just read the science, summarize the science, and make a recommendation? Well, it's complicated. Like we've talked about before, doing nutrition studies, we are looking at long-term outcomes. Because what we really want to know is, if I eat these foods on a regular basis when I'm a child, when I'm 20, when I'm 30, when I'm 40, am I more likely to end up having a heart attack when I'm 50, 60, 70? So we're talking about a very long range outcome. Um, In the interim, there's tons of compounding variables that are going to affect those long-term outcomes related to food and unrelated to food. And there's, it's really, really, really challenging, ergo impossible to control all of that. So the way we scientists um, try to make this more intelligible is we pick some proxy markers, which are more temporally favorable things to look at. So we may say, okay, if we eat all these foods, um, then our cholesterol goes up, then we're going to just say that if your cholesterol goes up, you're more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. Well, it, you know, most of these proxy markers do not translate with, you know, complete accuracy to the outcome that we're really looking about. Because we don't really care if our cholesterol is high. What we really care about is if we're going to drop dead of a stroke, right? I mean, it doesn't, the, the, the marker, the theoretical marker doesn't really matter. It's the outcome that matters. And so, you know, every every time you substitute one outcome for another outcome for another outcome, it's a little thing, like a little something is lost in translation. And this is not a extremely clean science. The other big problem, too, is that a lot of the scientific literature is looking at nutrients and these microscopic elements in the nutrients with a really um, sort of tunnel vision, when in reality, you don't eat those things. You eat food. And we do know that even the exact same molecular element in a different food item, in a different amount, taken in by a different individual with a different physiology, is going to be digested and absorbed and utilized differently in their bodies. So it's pretty unrealistic to make sweeping blanket recommendations about a teeny tiny microscopic element of food and say that that is a universal truth for all people who are eating foods and not nutrients, right? I mean, you go to the store to shop for foods. You prepare foods and eat foods. You don't prepare nutrients. So, I I mean, I just want to make the point, it's complicated. It's complicated. Now, I don't have the answer to that. But you have to know when you start looking at these hypotheses and these recommendations and the headlines and the study abstracts that All of those things I just said are true and are universally problematic for all people studying, you know, nutrition and health. That being said, we have to deal with 
what we have, right? And it's there is just no way to make this a really black and white, clean, um, bias-free scientific discipline. It's just how it is. And so we need to know what's out there. And in short, let me give you really the skeletonized version of what we know. There is good evidence that increased intake of saturated fats probably in most people increases their LDL cholesterol. Now, that being said, I need to make a comment about LDL cholesterol. Um, we are told, you know, by your doctor, by the, the American Heart Association, by the internet, by everybody, that LDL cholesterol is bad, HDL cholesterol is good. Well, that's a simplistic and not entirely accurate view. Um, LDL cholesterol particles come in a variety of sizes. And the real truth is that the small, dense LDL particles do show a association with cardiovascular disease. Whereas the large, they call them fluffy type LDL particles are not correlated with cardiovascular disease. Now this is important to know in what I said about saturated fat because it appears that the increase in LDL cholesterol that happens with increased saturated fat intake is these large fluffy type particles. So like I said before, do we actually care about the LDL cholesterol total or do we care about its um, translation into cardiovascular risk? You know, I think the latter, but that's something that's not really discussed. And you're thinking to yourself, how do I know about my LDL particle size? Well, that's actually a specialized test. Your standard um, kind of lipid panel that your doctor orders does not separate out the different particle sizes of LDL cholesterol. It just groups them all together. And generally speaking, your doctors, when they sell the LDL cholesterol going up, are going to reflexively say that's bad, even without knowing what subtype of LDL cholesterol is making up that total number. Okay, the other thing that's important to know is that there are different saturated fats, and it does appear that the types of foods that these saturated fats are in, they call that sort of the food matrix, makes a big difference. It appears that dairy saturated fat and saturated fat that comes from unprocessed um, animal meats is not bad. In fact, there may be a smattering of evidence showing that it's actually um, good and reduces uh, risk of diabetes in some people. It's possible that the saturated fats that are added during um, you know, food production, like factory food, processing of food, whether that's meats or snack food, may be more concerning and... Uh, potentially more hazardous, I guess, than dairy fats and animal, unprocessed animal fats. But it's really complicated to just isolate that from all the other nutrients, from the whole dietary pattern of the individual and all the other variables that are going on. So here's the takeaway. Saturated fats are a very diverse group of compounds. Probably can't be all considered together and certainly shouldn't be considered bad across the board. Even though the interesting thing is that our government and all the other agencies that make dietary recommendations have continued to rigidly restrict the upper limit of saturated fats for all people in all communities in 
all, you know, states of health for 50 or more years. But the science is emerging that that's really an antiquated and um, outdated way of looking at saturated fat. We need to know a little more about LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is a diverse set of molecules and the bottom line is that LDL cholesterol by itself, not knowing uh, different sizes, um, is not a really great predictor of cardiovascular disease. And that's what we're looking for, right? Um, the decreasing saturated fat intake in order to lower that LDL cholesterol also has shown that it can lower the HDL cholesterol and therefore by lowering both, it really doesn't impact the ratio very much, which is something that we have pretty strong uh, correlation with heart disease. So the summary of that is that Number one, we're probably not going to be able to restrict saturated fats as much as any governing body has ever told us to do. That's just probably not realistic in our food environment. Number two, we are using a proxy marker for heart disease that may not be a fantastic marker. And... Number three, we need to keep in mind that saturated fats are a diverse group and naturally occurring saturated fats, ergo animal products and dairy, are probably not as problematic as um, sort of uh, produced products with saturated fats. Now... All of that evidence. Listen, here's the deal. You eat food. You don't eat molecules. You don't eat elements. You don't even eat nutrients. And if we continue to micromanage and manipulate and substitute and stress out and supplement and restrict all these little teeny tiny things... Um, there's almost a guarantee that your health is going to be worse. The stress, both psychologically and physiologically, of trying to manage something that is essentially out of your control is going to have way more adverse effects on you than anything you're probably eating. So what is my recommendation with saturated fat? It's not any different than my recommendation in general. Let your body do what it's supposed to do. It is amazingly complex, and I just don't believe we are going to outsmart, outwit human biology. What is a good idea is trying to diversify your diet to the best of your ability and how diverse that is depends on your level of access, your cultural preferences, your taste, your schedule, your family situation. If you're able to include a broad range of plants and some animal products, if you care to do that, that's great. But food is only part of health. Your ability to sleep and manage your stress and purposefully move and go outside and have strong social connections are also things that will impact your health. So, you know, food is one thing. The fat in your food is an even smaller thing. The saturated fat in your food is an even smaller thing. And if we get too waylaid by these smaller and smaller and smaller things, um, it's, it's not going to serve our health. I mean, that's almost a guarantee. So 
just try to chill out a little bit and take um, what I would consider a more laid back approach to nutrition. And instead of micromanaging nutrients and parts of nutrients and, and, you know, counting in decimal quantities of nutrients, pick things that you enjoy, experiment a little bit, make food fun again, and take some of the stress out. That's, that's not the mainstream narrative, but uh, I really think that's going to serve you the best. If you do have concerns about specific health conditions, in particular cardiovascular disease, uh, talk to your doctor, check your lipids, but um, go a little further with your cholesterol if you're really wanting to know your risk. Uh, there's a lot more than there appears to be on first pass. And I want to help you make food and nutrition part of your life, a part that you enjoy, not a part that you resent and stress out about because there's so much more out there for you. And I hope that you've gotten some benefit from this conversation. I know it's a little technical um, beyond probably some of your desires, but the confusion about saturated fat is real. So don't let it distract you. Just know that you're in good company, that many of the nutritionists and healthcare professionals and even the scientists that are studying these things still disagree with one another. Um, it's complicated. And there's no reason you need to take on that complexity as a source of stress. All right. I want to remind you again, there's a new episode every Wednesday of my podcast. And if you are kind enough to leave a rating or review on your podcast platform, that uh, helps me greatly by getting this conversation into the ears of more people. But I appreciate you joining me today and we'll talk next time. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at maggielandismd.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon.